Welcome to another episode podcast of the Antelope Valley Chambers of Commerce Chamber Talk. My name is Mark Hemstreet. I'm the CEO for the Antelope Valley Chambers of Commerce. And today we have Dr. Bronstein with Kaiser Permanente. I'm um, Dr. Welcome to our Chamber Pod uh, podcast and welcome to our show. Thanks for coming today. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. I appreciate it. Good. So we talked a little bit earlier off offline, and and you were telling me a little bit about what you do with Kaiser. You wear a whole bunch of hats. <laughs> um, you're you're one of over a thousand employees um, up working for Kaiser up in the Antelope Valley. So give me a little bit of your background. Where'd you come from? Where'd you go to school? And where'd you do your residency? And how did you end up in the? How did how how were we so lucky to have you in the Antelope Valley? Great. So yeah, I I grew up in Woodland Hills actually, and I. I grew up there, went to Taft High School in Woodland Hills, and then I went... Taft Toridors, way to go. That's like right. hearing that. <laughs> and then I went to UC San Diego for undergrad, and I stayed there for medical school. And then after that, I went to UCLA uh, for my uh, residency in mm -hmm. uh, pediatrics, and then I stayed there for a fellowship in pediatric infectious disease, uh, also at UCLA. Uh while I was doing residency and while I was doing fellowship, I wanted to do some moonlighting and actually make a little bit of money. <laughs> and so <laughs> one of the few Kaisers at that time that was hiring just for some weekend work primarily uh, was uh, Kaiser Permanente out here in the Antelope Valley in Lancaster. And so I started doing some weekend work there, just doing general pediatric shifts and got to know uh, the staff there. And back then, Dr. Tadros, who was running everything out here, got yes. to know him very well. And uh, he offered me the position once I was done with my fellowship to stay on and do uh, both pediatric infectious disease and also do uh, just general pediatric clinic out here in the Antelope Valley. And so I took him up on the offer there and I just started doing the job. And I basically still to this day, I'm the only pediatric infectious disease doctor in the entire Antelope Valley, Kaiser wow. or otherwise. And so I'll see Kaiser patients. I'll also see non-Kaiser patients and help consult with especially kids in the hospital and other community pediatricians if they have questions. I'm always happy to help there. Wow. Interesting. And, and of course, I mean, this year being 2020 wrapping up here, um, but still this, this year, as far as infectious disease and control, I bet a bit your work just tenfold um, jumped up and and I mean probably probably exciting too for I me. Mean, it's a challenge. I mean this is this is a whole new challenge that that you probably wasn't on your radar. I'm sure. Absolutely, and it's it's very strange where all of a sudden everything that I've always cared about has somehow aligned. So, you know, infectious disease. Obviously, we're seeing infectious disease right now in a way that we never have before. I think anyone off the street now knows what an epidemiologist is. And one thing I didn't mention is that I also have a degree in epidemiology yeah. from the UCLA School of Public Health. And so uh, my interest in epidemiology, I've been doing a ton of work for the last decade or so in terms of educating people on importance of vaccinations, especially the flu vaccine every year. And now, of course, we're talking about our COVID vaccines. And so all the vaccine work has been important. Also, one of the other roles that I've had since I started at KP has been um, the physician lead for equity, inclusion, and diversity in the Antelope Valley. And so all of these health equity issues that we hear about as well in terms of who's getting sick with COVID, in addition to, of course, the whole social justice movement going on right now, all of these things converged in this year. And again, it's everything that I've always found important and cared about. And obviously it's very tragic what's going on right now, but it's also from my perspective, it's really nice to have a, a skill set where I can get involved on many levels throughout this whole pandemic, which has been uh, very satisfying personally to know that I can do a lot to help in this case. And you can have an Im a big impact in our, in our Valley, our local community, which is really awesome. That's great. Um, so I want to kind of open up for you and, and tell me what's going on. I mean, I mean, this year has obviously been just a real you know roller coaster ride of a year for us with, with shutting down, you know, businesses and then reopening them and then shutting them down. Do you see the correlation in, in, in shutting down businesses? And then, uh, you know, do you see the direct correlation when we do shut down the business or not so much? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, it's a tough one to answer. It's really tough to 
th there's so many factors here involved in terms of how the virus is spreading through our population as a whole, not just locally, but nationally and worldwide, but also the mitigation measures that we're doing. And I understand where they come from and, and why we need to do so many of those measures. And, and I think it's key that we do things as safe as we possibly can. Um, you know, here we have a virus where there is no good treatment for. Uh, there just isn't. Any of the ones you hear about, remdesivir or the monoclonal antibodies, these are not great treatments. These are last-ditch last efforts. They're not uh, cure-alls by any means. They're not like giving penicillin for a strep throat and you know you fixed it. Right. There's no good treatment. We've got a virus that now nationwide has killed over 300,000 people. Um, it's extremely deadly for some people, extremely dangerous for other people. It's a virus where you can spread it before you even know you have it and have no symptoms and you can still spread it to another person. Um, it's everything about this virus until we're able to get it under control. And the only way to do that, honestly, is going to be a vaccine. Everything about it is absolutely scary and frightening. And so all the measures that we've done in terms of wearing a mask, distancing, um, and like you said, businesses being affected and, um, and you know, hygiene and all the other things we're supposed to do, that's pretty much all we could do in order to keep keep us safe uh, from this because there's no other option until, again, the vaccine is widely available. In terms of should businesses be shut down or which ones should be shut down or should schools be shut down for that matter, I think there's ways of doing so many of the things that we traditionally do but doing them safely. Mm -hmm. And if everybody would take the right precautions and wear the masks the correct way, you know, cover the nose, not just over the mouth or over the chin. Or I, We've all seen it. We all get frustrated by it. I get it. Yeah. But if people would take adequate precautions and distance and not have big crowds of people huddled together, um, I think there's ways of doing so many things safely. And, and it's really hard to say that everyone needs to shut down when there's ways of doing it safely. So, you know, I feel the pain. I feel the struggle. And I understand where, where a lot of those rules come from. But I think, you know, we need to be very rational and thoughtful about, you know, the, the impact of these things. Right. So, I mean, you do pediatrics. So, I mean, you're specializing in, in, in children, adolescents, whatever. Um, they, they don't seem to be affected as much. So they're probably more, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, I know when I go to my doctor, um, he tells me I have to get a flu shot. And I, and, um, I told him, I said, you know, I don't get the flu. I mean, I haven't had a flu in 10 years. I've never had a flu shot. Why do I need a flu shot? And he goes, well, you should have a flu shot. <laughs> okay, I got a flu shot. But, I mean, I, I've been exposed to the, fl the flu virus. Um, I just don't, either, I, either I'm asymptomatic or I, I just don't get sick. So it's the same thing with, is it the same thing with kids that they're, they can be exposed to the virus, but they're not getting sick by it? Yeah, so... Definitely. There's a lot for me to unpack in, in everything you just said there, but uh, absolutely. I could see some parallels there. First of all, with flu um, and your, your logic there is faulty. And okay. I, you know, and I hear this all the time. You're not alone in saying I'm special. I don't get sick. I don't get the flu. What you need to do is start thinking about the flu. Like we think about COVID. Okay. When I think about COVID right now, I think, my gosh, anybody can have it. Anybody without symptoms can have it and spread it without knowing it. And while I'm not as worried about myself getting COVID or honestly my kids getting COVID, I'm deathly afraid that I can have it without knowing it and spread it to my mom right? who's elderly. And if she gets COVID, that could be a death sentence. Flu is the same way. And I know we don't traditionally think about it that way, mm -hmm. but a half to a third of people who get the flu have no symptoms, but can still shed the virus if you're not protected with the vaccine. And so the concept of I don't get the flu, but who you probably did get the flu right. over that 10 right. year right. period, right. you were healthy, but you probably got it. But the scary thing is you were able to shed that virus and you were able to give it, unfortunately, to people without knowing it and them getting sick. Um, 
The other thing with flu too is unfortunately every year we see plenty of healthy people like yourself who think I never get the flu and then wind up in the hospital, the ICU, or sometimes not make it out of there. Right. To me, it's like saying, I don't get in car accidents, so I'm not going to wear a seatbelt. Right? right, right. You just no, I, never know when the big one's coming. Right. And for a vaccine that's safe, that's effective, that's been around since World War II, and we know it actually works very well. It may not prevent every case of flu, but it's very good at preventing complications from the flu. Um, there's no reason for any of us not to get it, not just for ourselves, but to protect those around us. So when it comes to kids, you know, unlike with flu, uh, with COVID, kids, you're right, don't seem to have the same severe infections with it. Now with flu, kids are the ones who spread the flu. Kids are right. the mosquitoes. They're the ones who absolutely take it home from school, from daycare. They bring it home to the family, to their grandparents. If all kids, only if we only immunize kids against the flu, and every single kid got it, we would not have a flu season because kids are so responsible for spreading it. For COVID, it's wow. different. Kids <laughs> can get COVID, and we see it plenty of times. Now, teenagers are acting more like adults with COVID. And mm -hmm. even right now, throughout some of our Kaiser hospitals, we have some teens who are in ICU settings and very sick with COVID. So teenagers, totally different story. Kids under 10 seem to do better with it. They actually seem to do... Uh, quite well. Either they're less symptomatic, mild symptoms like your typical cold. They don't seem to be the ones spreading it to the parents as much as the parents are the ones spreading it to them. So it's kind of the reverse of influenza in that case. Um, but kids uh, seem to do better. Now, having said that, there's been 12 or 1300 kids across the country who have had that MISC, that multi-system inflammatory syndrome, uh, which is a very severe illness. And so this usually happens about a month later where a child may not have even knew they were sick, and then a month later, it's more of an immune system response, and you have kids who are very, very ill who wind up in usually a ICU setting. Most of them do fine. However, a few kids have actually passed away from that MISC, as we call it. And so there are some serious potential consequences, but for the most part, it doesn't seem like kids are as affected. Right, right. And long-term, we I mean, we still don't know. I mean, obviously, this has only been out for less than a year, so we don't know what the long-term effects are of having COVID. I mean, it's not like the influenza flu that we know there really isn't any long-term effects. You get it, you get over it, day goes on. Um, but COVID, I know there, there's some other, I mean, they're having some of the, like you just talked about that. Um, and other problems I've, I've understood that we just don't quite, we haven't quite wrapped our arms around the whole virus yet. Absolutely. And and it's it's frightening, actually, when you think about it. And that's another, you know, I know there's a number of people out there who are thinking, well, why don't we all just, who are young and healthy, why don't we all just infect ourselves and let the old people stay away for a while and then we'll be fine. The problem is, like you said, even for young, healthy people, we are seeing people who are getting these, uh, what we call the long haulers right now, where it's almost, uh, and it seems like it's very similar to anyone who knows about chronic fatigue syndrome, where you have these long lasting fatigue, you have memory fog, all these other changes in your body, you know, it's the way you feel when you're sick and the body kind of shuts down. Uh, but that persists long after the infection's even gone. And it seems like if you look on mainly social media is where we're hearing about these cases, but there's so many of these cases, you have to believe it, that there are some potential long-term effects, even in healthy people. Not to mention people, you know, if you look at the adult population, half of us have chronic diseases. And so anyone with most of these chronic diseases, whether it's obesity, whether it's hypertension, whether it's heart disease, diabetes, you name it, they're at risk for uh, more serious acute infection from COVID. Uh, but a lot of those ac acute infections can cause damage either to the heart, the blood vessels, and other things, or the lungs, of course, and these can have lasting implications. Um, so... Uh, so that's, that's a scary thing, that we just don't know uh, what this virus is going to keep doing if, if we're not able to prevent it. Um, you know, with flu as well, though, we do see lasting implications from flu. Okay. And, you know, I know we think of flu as causing a mild cold, but every year we see tens of thousands of people passing away from flu. Right. We see right. complications where I've seen flu go to the brain in kids. I've seen flu go to the heart in kids and cause something called myocarditis where it just eats away at the heart muscle. 
And of course, the pneumonias and some kids right. don't recover, and some adults for that matter, of course, don't recover from these and have permanent injury to their organs for for the rest of their lives, which is always tragic, especially with flu, because it's something that, of course, is preventable. So, Wow, interesting. Yeah, I know. I mean, influenza is, is pretty deadly itself. I mean, it doesn't have the, the rate that, that the COVID does, but it's still, it's it's not something to be taken lightly. Um, and I get my flu shot now every year, so I'm... I'm Good. I'm glad to hear it. I, I got the lecture, <laughs> so I know what I'm doing now. So, yeah. In that case, I take back everything I just told you. <laughs> no, no, thank no. Thank you for getting it. But, but again, really, thank you for no, doing but, it. And, right. It's, it's part of that of being that, that, they, that herd mentality of, of if we no. all get vaccinated, it really drops it off. I mean, it's even like, you know, um, I mean, I'm part of Rotary, and one of, one of Rotary International's big um, goals is to eradicate polio. Mm. And, you know, we are 99.9% eradicated polio, there's like one or two countries that I think last year there was like three cases of polio. So we are, we are almost there, but once, once everybody has been, once, once we've erased it off the, off the, it'll never come back. Right. We've eliminated it right. forever. And, but it's that herd mentality. You got to get everybody on every part of the, of the world, you know, and, and COVID's going to be the same thing. You know, we've got to, you know, got to get that vaccine and, and, and people really need to take it. So we can achieve that herd, you know, protection and keep us all safe. I'm sure you hear a lot of that. I mean, people talking about the side effects or the long-term side effects, or we don't know what's going to happen with the vaccine. Um, I hear from the from the, the medical side of it, of uh, everything I've read is that, yeah, there might be, you know, you might be a little achy or whatever, um, but but they think that the 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 positive far outweigh the, the one or two days that you're feeling bad. What's your feeling on, on what the, the two that we have right now vaccines out there? Um, do you see any problems with people taking them or? Excellent question. And I personally feel that these vaccines look incredibly effective and look incredibly safe, which is great. Uh, I'm going to get mine as soon as I'm able to. We prioritize in terms of who's exposed to whom and, and who should get it first, even amongst our healthcare workers. So uh, I'm not getting it over the next few days, but hopefully next week when we get our next ship in, in I'll be first in line to get it if I'm the correct prioritization <laughs> and the right person to get it. I don't want to jump in front of anyone else just to prove, hey, I'm getting it as safe. Um, but I absolutely will get it for myself. And when it's time for my family, I'm going to make sure they get it as well. Um, I know there's concerns with it, and, and rightfully so, and I'm glad that people have questions, and I'm glad that some people are skeptical and are asking the right things about, especially about safety. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to effectiveness, I don't think any of us dreamed, you know, a few months ago that we would have a vaccine that was 90 to 95% effective, yes. uh, but it is, and those studies look very convincing. And of course, there's still more analysis that's going to be done to prove. And and once we have more of us in the general population getting it, we'll also be able to continue to monitor and see how effective it is. Uh, but those preliminary studies make it look like it's incredibly effective, which is great. Uh, the safety concern is is understandable, and I think all of us should know what we're putting in our bodies and if it's safe or not. And when you look at the side effects people are having uh, from the vaccine trials, and now we're going to hear a lot more that so many more of us are getting the vaccine. um, Sure. It seems to be causing some uh, what we call reactogenicity or, or reactions, uh, not even so much side effects, if you will. uh, But that's our own body's immune response reacting to something. And so when you see people talking about feeling fatigued afterwards for a day or so or having a headache with it, um, those are some of the more common ones in addition to just, oh, my arm is a little sore or my arm is red. These are the things that are happening and will happen, and I would expect those to happen. And and any vaccine can cause those. Um, so none of this is really a surprise. So I think to me it's all about risk and benefit. You know, the risk of the vaccine, which really right now seems very safe, very negligible, uh, compared to the benefit of preventing the illness, which is just wreaking havoc on our lives, killing people, destroying our economy and and local business. Um, To me, the decision's a very easy one. Mm 
But again, I know everyone thinks a little differently. And what I'm hoping is that when you start seeing, hey, my doctor got it or my friend got it or people I know got the vaccine, they're doing great. Hopefully everyone will become more comfortable uh, with that. And, and they should. Now, of course, we this was all made very quickly. And I know people have concerns. Uh, if you did these trials so quickly, how do you know? Were, were steps skipped or how did we do that? And the good thing is the trials were done quickly, but they were done in a way to allow them to be done in that, that quick fashion. So multiple steps of the trial, multiple phases of the trial were sometimes done at the same time. And the vaccine was made while the trials were being done. And before we even knew the vaccine was effective, they were still producing millions and millions of doses on the off chance that if it was effective and it was safe, based on the studies, we'd have them ready to go. And that's how we do have the vaccines available right now. So the companies that were making the vaccine, they weren't skipping any of the phases of the trial. They weren't. They still enrolled tens of thousands of people in the phase three trials, which was vitally important. And uh, to me, it was very reassuring as well when I look at, and sometimes I call into the meetings by the FDA or the CDC, all these meetings and all these questions that are being asked and the data that's being reviewed in such a thorough and thoughtful manner Sure, a lot of people are having a lot of late nights reviewing these things instead of taking the months and months it typically would. But uh, everything that I've seen reassures me that the correct amount of thought is going into uh, the approval of these vaccines to allow us to use them. And even once the FDA approves them and even once the CDC comes out with recommendations in terms of how they should be given – we still, in California, we have an independent body of physicians right. who also has to review the data and give it their approval. And I know a number of them uh, over the years personally, and these are the top of their fields in you know, infectious disease and epidemiology and virology. These are experts. Um, and even in the Kaiser Permanente system, we also have our own team of experts who reviews the data, reviews the studies, and doesn't just take the word of the FDA, doesn't just take the word of the CDC, or even the state governing body for that matter. We review it ourselves and decide it's something we can give to ourselves, but also to our members. So that to me makes me very, very comfortable with this. Of course, we don't have follow-up data. We don't know the answer to the question of, will we need another vaccine? And a few yeah. years from now, if something mutates or whatever, who knows? Or how long immunity is going to last for? We don't know. The virus was only here at the beginning of the year. We, we don't know these things. Uh, time will tell on those. But the most important question right now is the immediate question of, is it safe to get right now? Uh, having followed people for a few months afterwards, which is what the companies have done, uh, it looks like they're, we're not seeing any sorts of long-term effects and so safety-wise, I'm totally comfortable getting it. Nice. And we talk about herd immunity. We're not just talking, I mean, I mean, we're talking that they want, like, uh, I've heard the number 70% thrown out there. 70% of our entire population, that means from infants to elderly? Or is that just, who all has to have it? Where do we need to be at? Right. And 70% is just an estimate. It depends on a lot of things. It depends on how prevalent the disease is in the population. It depends on, um, you know, how effective the vaccine is. So a very effective vaccine, you may be able to get away with a smaller percentage there. Um, so lots of things that go into it. It depends on who's had the virus before to a certain extent, although we still don't know how long that immunity will last for. So 70% is just an estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, the rule of thumb is as many people as possible. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, and yes, you do need to achieve a level of protection. Otherwise, yes, the virus can come back again. And you see what happened with measles, for example. I mean, you yes. talk about eradicating polio. Measles should have been eradicated too. Mm -hmm. Both of them should have been eradicated years and years and years ago. It's just for one reason or another, and we know a lot of those reasons, uh, people stop vaccinating at the high numbers they needed to to really wipe these viruses out. You know, any virus that doesn't have an animal reservoir should be able to be eradicated, like smallpox was. Right. But you need to have that immunity, and so, uh, so the exact number I don't think anybody knows right now. But obviously, we want to get close to that seventy percent uh, with regard to kids. Right now, uh, the vaccines haven't been studied in kids at least most of them haven't and the, those studies haven't been published the ones that have been 
And so we are not comfortable yet recommending it for kids. Uh, that will change. Once the studies have been done, um, then we can start recommending it for children as well. Fortunately, again, though, kids don't seem to be the ones who are spreading this the most, even amongst themselves. So I, I'm perf perfectly comfortable waiting to Im immunize the kids until we've already immunized those who are at the highest risk and known to be spreading the virus as much as possible. Uh, the key, though, is getting a good enough percentage of the people who are responsible for spreading it. And that's the young, healthy people who are going to say that I don't get sick, I've had it before, I'm going to keep going to my bars and not wearing my mask and doing all that. You know, it's that 18 to 35-year age right. range right now who are spreading the most disease. Now, if you look at who's dying from the disease, 85 and up, that's the worst. But the right. people spreading it are the young and vulnerable people, if you will. And these are the people who, knowing that, you know, and I get it. I was young once too. You know, we all like to do things and engage in whatever behaviors. That's fine. But think about those around you. And if you're protected, then you can get back to normal life even quicker and do the things that you enjoy. So, so yeah, 70 percent's a good estimate, but you know, no way of knowing that for sure. Problem right now is while there's so much virus in the community, even if we were to vaccinate seven, 70 percent of people overnight right now we still wouldn't see a huge effect yet because there's just so much virus that's going on right now. And it takes time to build up that immunity. Right. Right. Um, wow. That's, that's a lot, lot to, lot to take in at one time. So, but you don't, I mean, so it's really 18 and above that, that you're doing the, that will be the really the first big wave of vaccines. Technically it's been approved in 16 and above for the Pfizer vaccine. I'm not sure what they're going to do with the Moderna vaccine. They're having their meetings tomorrow on that and they'll decide. Uh, that was one of the sticking points with the, um, with the Pfizer vaccine. I know initially there were a few people in that FDA advisory committee who were debating or voting against approving the vaccine. It wasn't that they were against the vaccine. They weren't necessarily as comfortable dropping the age down to 16 but the vast majority of people, based on the trials that were done, 16 looked like a, a, a appropriate age to drop it down to. So in terms of the recommendations of who should get it when, right now we're still in that first phase of healthcare workers and long-term facility uh, residents and staff. Uh, once we start seeing about essential workers, for example, then we'll really see more advice in terms of what age it should be given at. Um, and, you know, when we look at people with chronic diseases, that also will be looking at ages as well. And that's really, especially when you get to the chronic diseases, that's where we would think about 16-year-olds who may have medical issues. They would be the ones okay. we really want to drop that age down. And by then, honestly, we'll probably have more trials done and younger kids as well, and we can start recommending it there too. Nice. So Antelope Valley, how, how are we How are we? compared to like Los Angeles or other counties or other areas in our, in Southern California? Yeah, I know. Uh, I wish I could say uh, we're, we're doing well. Um, and in many respects we're, we are doing well, but when it comes to absolute numbers of cases, both in Lancaster and in Palmdale, unfortunately uh, we're amongst the highest in LA County. And so I think we rank number third and fourth when it comes to number overall numbers of COVID cases. And so I think if I remember correctly, and don't quote me on this, and this yeah. obviously changes day by day, we're around, you know, nine or 10,000 cases in each. Palmdale is a little bit more, uh, has more cases than uh, Lancaster does at this point. So we are ranked amongst the highest counties. And if you put all of AV together, uh, so Palmdale plus Lancaster joined together, we would be number one in terms of numbers of cases thus far. So, uh, and we feel it, you know, if, go to AV Hospital, go to Palmdale Regional, and um, beds are full right now. Yeah. I'm not saying there's no capacity. We have capacity, but beds are full. ICUs are filled up. We are, you know, we're feeling the strain. And ask if you know anyone who's working at any of those places. Trust me, we're feeling the strain, just like everyone else oh, yeah. is right now. Absolutely. But but I just don't want us to feel like um, we're somehow different than the rest of the county, the rest of the state. Unfortunately, we're not, um, which is frightening, I know. 
but it's something that we should know. And it's something that our, our you know, if, if you're listening to this podcast, um, don't just take it for granted. We live, you know, over the hill from the LA base and that, that, that we're different. We're not. I mean, um, the disease spread just as fast up here as it does down there. Um, if you do a public gathering, if you're out hanging out without your mask on, if you're not washing your hands, um, you, you, you have a high risk of catching it. So you need to be careful. You got to keep your guard up all the time. It's like you say about driving. You know, you haven't been in an accident, so you don't wear a seatbelt. Well, you know, even if you haven't been in an accident, it doesn't mean you don't you don't come to a complete stop and you don't look both ways before you cross the street and everything like that. You still do it. You still keep up that that protection for yourself and protecting yourself is also going to protect your family. Absolutely. Good deal. Anything else you want to put out for us? Uh, I, really, my best advice, I know we're coming up on holiday time right now. And trust me, I, I want to spend it with my family too. I want to travel. There's a lot of things I'd love to do right now. I'd love to have a big gathering at home. I'd love to do all these things. I'm not going to do it this year. We really need to be careful. Uh, you know, we're still feeling the impact of Thanksgiving and not heeding the advice of our experts here. And I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about Dr. Fauci and friends. But, um, you know, unfortunately, many of us didn't heed that advice. And we're paying the price for it right now in terms of people being sick and bad things happening. So the best advice I can give right now is is just use your best judgment and use our best judgment, honestly. <laughs> Yours may not, listen no, to use, the experts, right? Listen to the experts. Um, you know, unfortunately right now, we're in a time where when I look at the tests that we're doing on people who don't have any symptoms, about a quarter of those are coming back positive, meaning one out of every four people that you may be interacting with may have COVID without knowing it. Right. And when you're going to a party and you're not with someone who's already in your immediate family, in your immediate bubble, who you're around without your mask all the time with, this isn't the time to start expanding those bubbles. This isn't the time to start being exposed to people without your mask on. Um, and so, you know, this holiday is going to be different. It's going to feel different, but find creative ways of doing that. You know, the principles to follow here indoors, close together, no mask, talking loudly, singing, yelling, breathing heavily, bad idea. <laughs> Outdoors, by yourself, with a mask on, <laughs> good idea. You have to find the level in between there um, to be as safe as possible. So outdoors, with a mask, distanced apart, that's fine. As long as it's within county laws and everything, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but we should be as close to that as we possibly can be right now. This isn't the time to start um, taking this for granted. We really need to get through these holidays safely and we need to preserve capacity in our hospitals and in our clinics and, and everything. You know, there's hope on the way. There's hope that's here. The vaccine is here. It's going to take time though, before enough of us get enough of the vaccine to have that herd immunity you were talking about. And in the meantime, we still have to wear our masks, keep our distance, wash our hands, uh, do all those things that, that are recommended it's for, for everybody, not just us, but those around us. Good. Well, I thank you for coming on the show today. Um, so uh, if you're out there, you know, get your flu shot and get your COVID uh, vaccine. I mean, you need to have both of them. It's not either or. You need to do both of them this year. And uh, probably in the next couple of years to follow, I would imagine we're going to be seeing this. It's not going to go away tomorrow. So we got to be vigilant on this thing and, and keep it up. Um, Dr. Bruce, thank you for, for coming on uh, Chamber Talk today with the Antelope Valley Chambers of Commerce. We appreciate you coming on, and uh, I want to thank everybody for listening, and uh, thank you for uh, coming to the Antelope Valley Chambers of Commerce. Great. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it.